Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we're going to begin the funeral services of Jeffrey Elliott Haas. Rabbi Alan Kensky will be officiating. For those of you who are online, we welcome you. And for those of you who are here, please take a moment, a last gentle reminder to be sure your cell phones have been turned off. Korea has, the ceremony of Korea has already been completed. And at this time, we're going to begin the sacred funeral ceremony. Begin with the 23rd Psalm. Ms. Morla David, Adonai Roi, Loer Sar. Be not deshe yarbitseni, al me minuchot in a haleni. Naf she shove, yan cheni, vemagle tzedek, laman shemo. Gam ki elech begait salmavet, lo irara ki ata imadi. Shivtecha umishantecha, hema yenachamuni. Taroch le fanai shulchan neged sorerai, di shanta vashem in roshi kosir vaya. Ach tov vachesed yer defuni kol yeme chayai, vishavti bevet adonai le orech yamim. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God has me lie down in green pastures, God leads me beside the still waters. God guides me on paths of righteousness. God revives my soul for the sake of God's glory. Though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no harm, for you are with me. Your staff and your rod do comfort me. Who set a table in sight of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall abide in the house of the Lord forever. I read Psalm 15, which describes the person of integrity, which Jeff most assuredly was. O Lord, who shall dwell in your sanctuary? Who shall abide upon your holy mountain? He who lives with integrity does what is right and speaks the truth in his heart who has no slander upon his tongue, who does no evil to his fellow human being, who does not reproach his neighbor. In his eyes, a vile person is despised, but he honors those who revere the Lord. He takes an oath in, even to his own harm and does not change. He does not lend money at usurious interest. He does not take a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things shall stand firm forever. I read Psalm 90. O Lord, you have been our refuge from generation to generation. Before the mountains were born, before the earth was fashioned, from eternity to eternity, you are everlastingly God. But humans, you crumble to dust. You say, return, O mortals. A thousand years are in your sight as a passing day and hour of night. You sweep us away and we sleep. Like grass, we flourish for a day. In the morning, we sprout afresh, but by nightfall, fade and wither. In your anger, we are consumed. In your wrath, we are overcome. You set out our sins before you, our secrets before your presence. Your wrath darkens our days, our lives expire like a scythe. Three score and ten our years may number, four score years if granted the vigor. Laden with trouble and travail, life quickly passes and flies away. Who can know the power of your anger? Who can measure the reverence due you? Teach us to use all of our days that we may attain hearts of wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long must we suffer? Have compassion upon your servants. Grant us of your love in the morning that we may joyously sing all our days. Match days of sorrow with days of joy equal to the years we have suffered. Then your servants will see your power, then their children will know that your glory. The favor of the Lord our God be upon us. God will establish the work of our hands. 
the work of our hands, God will surely establish. Almighty God, Rebono Shalom, Lord of the living and the dead, the hearts of your children who mourn are heavy with grief. Give them comfort. Help them to remember the triumphs and the joys in the life of Jeffrey Haas. Help them to treasure what is theirs because Jeff lived. Help them to meet grief with courage, to confront the angel of death with life. When despair threatens, when faith falters, sustain us all, O Lord, our refuge and our strength, our ever-present help. And let us say, Amen. This past Shabbat, just hours before the onset of Tisha B'Av, when we mourn the destruction of both the first and second temples of Jerusalem and the beginning of our exile, of the exile of our people from our homeland, our beloved Jeffrey Haas left this world for that world which is totally Shabbat. The suddenness of his passing in the prime of life with so much to live for has left us reeling and has left us bereft of this vibrant, warm, and loving Jewish soul who was such an integral part of all our lives. Jeff was a much beloved husband, father, grandfather, brother and brother-in-law son-in-law, uncle and relative, and he was a most treasured friend to many. I mourn with all of you, having enjoyed many a Shabbat and Yom Tov meal in Jeff's company, and I always felt, as did so many of you, that Jeff had your back, that he would do anything and everything for you. And now he is no longer here with us. In the words that we read on Tisha B'Av, Echa, alas, how great is our loss. Today we come together to mourn, to bid farewell to our beloved Jeff, and to remember him for the wonderful human being the mensch that he was. Precisely because Jeff was so deeply loyal to family and friends, our sense of loss today is so profound. Jeff had a wide circle of friends, some going back to his days at Camp Shy, and others going back to his high school days at Niles East where he excelled in sports and was captain of the football team. Some of Jeff's friendships span generations. He was friends with children of his parents' friends, and his children are friends with his friends' children. I've been told that Jeff was the force that held this group of friends together. His bonds with his friends were as strong as those we associate with family. And in Jeff's large, extended family, he was beloved by all. Jeff was, was the second of three children born to Ethel and Maury Haas. He is survived by his sisters, Judy and Marcy, who mourn his passing deeply. When growing up, Judy and Marcy always felt protected when Jeff was around. And through their lives, his presence has been a true anchor for them. Over the years, Jeff developed strong relationships with Alvin and Scott. Scott recalls the many dinners he had with Jeff always ending with their figuring out 
when they would do it again. Alvin deeply appreciated Jeff's including him in get-togethers with Jeff's friends. Jeff had deep roots in Chicago. He was raised in Albany Park until he was seven years old when the family moved to Skokie. After he graduated from Niles East, Jeff studied at the U of I in Champaign-Urbana, taking an interest in computers, which he would pursue later. Jeff met Vicky through his sister, Marcy. Marcy and Vicky were studying together at Hebrew University, and Jeff came to visit Marcy, carrying a trunk loaded with jars of peanut butter, not available in Israel at the time for Marcy. Vicky met Jeff and immediately developed a crush on him. But it was not until several years later when Vicky and Jeff saw each other at the party celebrating Marcy's graduation from medical school that they began dating. But once they went out on their first date, they never dated anyone else. Jeff and Vicky married in April of 1985 and shared 36 years of marriage together. 36, twice high, two lives intertwined in love and mutual support. Jeff was the love of Vicky's life and her best friend. Vicki credits Jeff for many of the accomplishments of her own life. Without Jeff's encouragement and full support, she might never have taken on the challenge of a PhD program or seen her way through it. Jeff cheered her on and was behind her every step. Jeff and Vicki shared an abiding love of Israel that dates back to Jeff's time spent studying at Haifa University and living on kibbutz, where he developed a lifelong connection with his kibbutz family. Jeff and Vicky visited Israel whenever they could. Matt and Avi celebrated B'nai Mitzvah in Jerusalem, and I was privileged to join them for Avi's bar mitzvah celebration there. Zionism and love of Israel were instilled in Jeff by his family. His parents, Mori and Ethel Haas-Zichronam Livracha, breathed Yiddishkeit and love for Israel. And Jeff worked to instill this love in his children as well. Jeff was a deeply committed Jew a regular shulgoer who found his spiritual home at BHBE for many years, during which he sang in our choir, exercising his beautiful tenor voice, and served as ritual chair, working the floor on many a Shabbat morning, gracefully distrib distributing all the honors and serving on the congregation's executive board, where one of his main goals was to support me in my leadership of the congregation. Later, Jeff gravitated to Or Simcha and then Chabad, where he most certainly will be sorely missed. Jeff was a loving, devoted, adoring father to Matthew and Avi. His face lit up whenever he mentioned their names, whenever anyone spoke of their achievements. He quelled at every one of their successes and joys. There was nothing that Jeff wouldn't do for them. He traveled with Matthew to chess tournaments near and far. He introduced Avi to karate and golf. He took them on road trips. He drove them to college and back, and back again for winter break. 
I would marvel with more than a little concern when Jeff would tell me that he would drive practically nonstop to New York, eating sandwiches while driving, stopping only for gas and bathroom breaks. Simply put, Vicky, Matthew, and Avi were the apples of Jeff's eyes, the loves of his life. Jeff rejoiced when Matthew met Allison and Avi met, met Danielle, and he welcomed Allison and Danielle warmly to the family. I remember Jeff's joy at their wedding celebrations, and Jeff was blessed and overjoyed when Maya entered the world. Jeff forged a connection with her, and she delightfully called him Sabi. Jeff and Vicky drove to Boston during the pandemic to see Maya, and what a blessing it was to celebrate this past Passover with the entire extended family. Yes, extended family was so important to Jeff. Jeff worked for many years for his father-in-law, Shelley Usum of blessed memory in his Midas establishment. Shelley knew that he could lean on Jeff and trust him totally. Jeff's bonds with Andrea and Jeff Meltzer, Deanie and Sam, and of course, with Shelley and Sharon, were deep. Holidays were always celebrated together, and Jeff enjoyed every minute with the family. Jeff was a beloved uncle to Gabriella and Gregory, Tamar, Max, Sarah, Sari and her children, Luca and Eden, Nathan, and Jared and Eleanor, and their daughter, Miriam. All of them feel a profound sense of personal loss at Jeff's passing. Jeff, so full of life, had many other interests and passions. Eventually, he went back to pursue his interest in computers, studying computer science at DePaul University. He found the science exciting and the work intellectually stimulating. He began a, began a second career working at IT at Gallagher and was undoubtedly a valued member of that enterprise. Jeff, the high school athlete, pursued karate, earning a second degree black belt. He skied, ran, comp competed in a marathon, played handball, and was a lifelong hockey fan. Jeff had a true sense of fun. He loved life, and he loved people. He was a good listener. He was a down-to-earth guy, never putting on airs, and he marched to the beat of his own drum. All this came to an abrupt end this past Shabbat. Jeff's passing has left us enormously pained. In the face of our shared loss, we need to strengthen one another. We need to hold on to each other. Above all, we need to be there for Vicki, for Matthew and Avi, for Judy and Marcy, and for the entire family. Vicki, your loss is beyond measure, and the journey ahead is long and difficult. But know that as you take the painful first steps, you are not alone. Your strong family and your many friends will be at your side supporting you every step of the way. The work that you do at the Ark is sacred work, God's work, and we pray that you will summon the strength to continue 
your holy work. Madanavi, your father was blessed in seeing you develop into the high achieving and high aspiring, deeply committed Jews you are today. And you will continue to be a blessing to him in his memory as you lead your lives. Judy and Alvin, Marcy and Scott, Hold on to some of that strength that your brother gave you and know that you will be supported by your children as well. Tisha B'Av, thankfully, is behind us. We have entered a special time of the Jewish year, the Weeks of Comfort. For seven weeks, we read prophecies, haftarot, of consolation in our synagogues. In these prophecies, God, through the prophet, speaks to the people Israel and seeks to comfort them. The opening words of this week's haftarah set the tone. Comfort you, comfort you, my people, says the Lord. Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami. Through seven Sabbaths, this message of comfort is expressed through beautiful poetry and metaphor. Comforting after a loss is a long, protracted process that unfolds over many weeks and months. And while we see God as the ultimate comforter, we, each of us, are called on to be God's agents in this process. We are called on to become comforters. All of us here are called on to help comfort Jeff's family at this time. Let us shower them with our love in the days and weeks ahead. Let us be there with them and for them during the period of mourning and beyond. Jeff may have left our world, but the impact of his life will live on. The love and values that Jeff implanted in you, his beloved family, will continue to animate you. Jeff has helped make you who you are today and who you yet will be. Jeff's spirit will live on in his circle of friends who were brought together by him. And though Jeff will no longer be with you physically at your holiday and Shabbat gatherings, you will continue to gather and celebrate, and Jeff will be with you in spirit and in memory. May the soul of Jeffrey Elliot Haas, Yitzchak Isaac ben Moshe ve'etaleya, be bound in the bond of everlasting life. Tehe nishmato tsrura bitsror hachayim. Let us say, Amen. Now call on Jeff's son, Matthew Haas. Um, so I speak in front of people for a living, but I don't really have the words to convey the grief that my family and I feel today. All I can say is that the sadness is overwhelming. I know my father is a father, and that is what I want to talk about, and to talk about sadness would not convey how I remember my dad. Any memory I think of brings smiles to my face. Those who knew me and my father know two things. First, 
He was absolutely devoted to my mother, Avi, and myself with every fiber of his being. And second, he and I had an ongoing comedic banter for roughly the past 20 years that took up the majority of our conversations. I heard on more than one occasion that it entertained his work colleagues a great deal. He had a favorite line that I said about 15 years ago that he liked to share with anyone who would listen. And so in his honor, I am going to embarrass myself. <laughs> he had done or said something that aggravated me. That happened a lot. And I told him, and this is a quote, you are so bald that the hair on your head doesn't even count as hair. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if he was proud of that line or simply shocked that something like that could come out of my mouth. But I do know that he was proud of anything and everything that I did. The only thing I could have done to disappoint him was to think there was something I couldn't do. If I took eight classes a semester, he would suggest that taking 10 was well within my capabilities. And if two classes met at the same time, surely I could make half of each lecture and get by. <laughs> the last one was usually a joke. As some of you know, he drove me to chess tournaments for about 20 years, and he couldn't understand parents who criticized their kids. Nothing short of complete support and encouragement made any sense to him. I was able to walk through life knowing my father was proud of everything I did, and that was quite a way to grow up. He also taught me a great deal, but in very non-traditional ways. Contrary to what some might expect, I know nothing about clothing or cars, and relatively little about computers. He was a self-declared expert on all three. But I see his influence on my life every day, and it's mostly things that just rubbed off, and I caught them. Most of these are little quirks. Dad liked to quote random movie lines, and that is the primary way that Avi and I communicate. My dad did not have much to say in a crowd, and neither do I. Dad also believed in his own Haas brand of privacy. If you asked a question that wasn't your business, you deserved whatever answer you got. <laughs> and as my wife knows, and some other house sp Haas spouses might recognize, Strangers should not overhear what I think about any given topic, so taxi rides should happen in complete silence. <laughs> Some of the larger lessons have been indispensable in my life. I greatly admired that my father was not self-conscious about most things. He did not care what an onlooker would think what, about what he was doing. If he decided that something was the right thing to do, or at the very least that it was what he was going to do, he did it and that was that. And this brings me to my favorite Jeff Haas story. At the end of my senior year of college, I found out I was going to be inducted into Phi Beta Kappa. The ceremony was close to graduation, so at first nobody was going to come from out of town. That was fine, Allison was already in my life. She was able to inform me what a normal person wears and does at such an event and it was going to go swimmingly. As the ceremony got closer, mom told dad that he was going to go. So naturally, that is what happened. The day comes, I get all cleaned up, put my shirt and tie on, Allison meets me on my corner, and off we go. As we reach 112th and Broadway, a taxi pulls up in front of Tom's restaurant, the one from Seinfeld, and out hops dad wearing the Jeff Haas uniform of dark green khakis with a plaid shirt clutching two PC magazines and his phone charger. As we walk into the venue, he tells me a story that still makes me cringe a bit to this day. The security at Midway Airport was crowded that morning, so he had to sprint to get to his gate, yelling, wait, wait, hold the plane. He gets on. As they pull away from the gate, his seatmate asks why he is flying to Miami that morning. <laughs> At which point, Dad starts yelling, I'm on the wrong plane! <laughs> they taxi back to the gate, bring back the correct plane, and he gets on and goes to LaGuardia. 
Now had I been there, I would have been a bright shade of red as I walked onto the plane. I promise you he was not red, but he was also not done. <laughs> we walk into the building and people are mingling and they're setting up a reception for after the ceremony. We start shuffling in to where we were supposed to be and dad makes a pit stop. He walks up to the bar and asks for a Miller Lite beer, which he takes into the ceremony with his, two, with his two PC magazines, phone charger, and plaid shirt. So I have to say I was a little embarrassed, and I told him he shouldn't drink a bottle of beer at the ceremony, which merely received a shrug and another sip. I don't have the level of confidence needed to flaunt the norms of polite society. But dad went to the beat of his own drum, and this actually reminds me of a popular Jewish teaching. A Jew should carry two pieces of paper in their pocket, one of which reads, Bishvilini vraha olam. The world was created for me. On a day when someone needs confidence, they should read that. My memories of my dad are that piece of paper for me. But of course, dad didn't think the world was created for himself. He thought the world was created for his family. He loved my mom with all of his heart, and she, Avi, and I were the center of his world. He did everything he could every day to help us excel. And that is the most important lesson he taught me, how to be a husband and a father to my little girl. And in the last couple years of his life, he was a grandfather, and I think he was doing pretty well. In keeping with his personality, he refused to tell us what he wanted to be called. He waited for Maya to name him. She came up with Sabi. Now, it just so happens that Sabi is a perfectly good Hebrew word. It means my grandfather, and that is what he was. He was all hers. He adored her, and for the past two and a half years, she is all he and I talked about. When we video chatted, he would mostly just look at her and would tell her about 50 times in a single call that the next time he saw her, he was going to kiss her head. Now I'm surprised that I've been able to say so much because in reality, I've said far too little. There should have been more kisses, more silly stories, more of his inexplicably high-pitched laugh. <laughs> That's all true, and I have nothing profound to say about that, but there is one more act in the story I told just a moment ago. On that day in May 2012, Dad got a taxi back to the airport. The driver looked at him in the rearview mirror and said, you know, we talk about people like you. <laughs> Dad looked at him quizzically. What kind of people? And he said, people who go to the airport with no luggage. <laughs> now, I can't help but think that that is an apt metaphor for how my family and I are feeling right now. I'm on a trip I didn't expect, and I did not pack a bag. And over the past few days, I have felt on more than one occasion that I'm on the wrong plane. But while with more time, Dad might have finally taught me something about computers or cars, he already taught me what was important, and those lessons will be with me always. Dad, I don't own plaid shirts, but I'm going to take you with me everywhere I go. Our family will come together like it always does. I'll be sure to kiss the little girl's head, and I love you. Now call on Jeff's son, Avi Haas. So I wish I could give a big speech today about how much my dad meant to me under very different circumstances. It's really a surprise and a tragedy to be here right now. And to many, my dad was a man of few words, but what he said he meant. And what he said to those close to him, and especially to me and my mom and my brother, was that he loved us very much and he was so proud of us. He used to say to me that he wasn't really sure what the purpose of his life was 
until he had a family and children. When I was nervous or asking for advice, he used to always say to me, you have to fool him with the truth. It was his counter to living in a cynical world where people often assume the worst. It was his way of saying that honesty and integrity are the guiding principles that we should live by. And that's how he lived every day, and that's how I try to live every day. My dad was always interested in the things that I was interested in. It didn't matter what class I was taking or what system or disease I was learning in medical school. He just wanted to hear it all. He could sit on the phone for hours listening to whatever was going on. I remember in college talking to him about linguistic classes or the, the history of Brazil, or more recently giving very specific details about giving a thorough rectal exam. <laughs> and he just wanted to hear about what was going on. He was excited to hear about it. He wanted to hear it all. And he was always so supportive of me that whatever, my project would become his project. When I decided in high school I had to learn how to make paella, we drove all around hunting for the exact specific type of saffron I needed. Or when I decided I wanted to learn how to make challah, he sat with me, we watched YouTube videos, we learned how to knead and how to braid, and we learned how to make challah together. Many of you may know that my dad hadn't eaten a processed sugar for the better part of half a century. But in middle school, when I decided I needed to make a Thai banana coconut dessert, or whenever my wife, Danielle, would make a chocolate cake, there he was taking exactly one bite, saying to us that this dessert was worth it. My dad and I shared a love for many things, for salami and hot dogs, for bushmills, for going to shoal, for going to shoal on time, we're staying at Shul, walking home from Shul, singing Jewish songs, Jewish history, and of course, road trips. He used to drive from Chicago to Baltimore to pick me up for all my breaks. And we'd drive, we'd talk, we'd eat sandwiches, and the time would just fly by. I also remember that my dad loved to brave the elements. It would really excite him to figure out what to wear to beat the cold. In the depths of winter, He'd take me to golf lessons. It would be so cold, there was steam coming off my head. But there he was in four layers, proud to be watching me. It was the same thing with karate. He would spend hours watching me and Matthew take lessons, only to have his own lessons at a different time. Ultimately, he truly embodied the ethos of gamze yavor and gamzu latova. This too shall pass. And this is also for the better. That bad things happen, and you go on, and you treat every day as special. He would always remind me of this when I was upset. He hated to see us upset. There's no other way to feel right now, but I'll try my best to embody his attitude. Although his death was sudden, there's nothing left unsaid between us. He can leave Olam Hazeh with the knowledge that everyone, he know, everyone knows he loved them. We can move into the future with all of his confidence behind us. I'll miss him for the rest of my life. I'll try every day to make him proud. Now call on Jeff's longtime friend, Dr. Robert Fetter, Rob Fetter. Words are simply inadequate to capture the deep sorrow we all feel at this moment. To celebrate and honor Jeff's life, I hope to share some of my thoughts and memories. Jeff was one of my dearest friends, 
for 53 years. I met Jeff in 1968 when we both tried out for the football team at Niles East High School. Jeff was a great athlete and combined with his dedication and smarts rose to become the team captain. The football team was a great bonding experience. We enjoyed the camaraderie, the game, the exercise, and our private conversations in which we made fun of the coaches and the funny experiences on the team. The coaches told us to hit each other hard, but we were a bunch of Jewish boys whose mothers always told us not to hit. It was a real challenge for those coaches. There was the time the head coach, Puglisi, kept talking about running with reckless abandon, reckless abandon. One of our teammates turned to me and asked, who is this person, Rico Sabania, the coach keeps talking about? And another teammate proclaimed, I think I have him in my football card collection. Or the time Coach Ferguson told Mark Pollock that he blocked like a dead chicken and said, do you know what I mean, Pollock? Mark said, I'm sorry, I don't coach because my mom buys kosher chickens cut in eighths. <laughs> and Mark finished off by saying, Coach, I once saw a dead squirrel under the stairs, if that would be helpful. <laughs> the coach walked away just mumbling to himself. We laughed many times over the years recounting our football exploits. Jeff and I loved retelling these stories with his boys, Avi and Matthew, and my boys, Alex and Seth. It gave us special pleasure when they would retell the stories. Jeff and I always had long talks. We had our best talks between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m., driving around town, and occasionally ending up at an all-night diner. Mark Pollock, Jeff, and I became fast friends. We went to the Howard Theater once to see a new movie that had just come out, The Ten Commandments, with Yul Brenner and Charlton Heston. At the pivotal moment, Moses was about to lead the Hebrews out of Egypt. Mark suddenly stands up in the theater and yells at the top of his lungs, move them out, Mesh. <laughs> Disruptive, of course, but it was beyond funny. I can hear Jeff's infectious laugh, laughing so hard as he tried to catch his breath. Jeff attracted great lifelong friends, Mark Pollock, Sam Levy, Mitch Dayen, Louis Schutz, John Finnerty of Blessed Memory, Lisa and Ray Fisher, and many others. I always thought of Jeff at the head of a great fraternity. He would sit back saying very little, just listening to the conversation, just relishing in the camaraderie. The values Jeff cared about were the ethics and integrity of the person, loyalty to family and friends, love of Judaism and Israel, and of course, a sense of humor. Talk less and do more. That was Jeff's credo. He was the glue that held these friendships together. You may not know that Jeff, well, you, you now do know that Jeff studied karate for many years, ultimately getting Matthew and Avi involved. One time a bully was giving me a hard time. Jeff quietly stood by. Fortunately, the encounter de-escalated, but soon after Jeff told me, you know, that guy would never have laid a finger on you. Jeff had my back. And I realized it wasn't just me. Everyone knew Jeff had their back. My first and only ride on a motorcycle was Jeff's motorcycle. He taught me how it worked, and then he said, you want to take it for a spin? And I said, yes, and off I went. Our senior high school play was Fiddler on the Roof. Elisa and her brother David were in the play. I was honored to play Tevya. In those days, the jocks and the thespians did not mix, oil and water. But Jeff got all the guys on the football team to come to the performance. He even lent me his boots to round out my costume. He was proud of me. He was always proud of all his friends and family. If you were lucky, you got invited to Jeff's house for Shabbat dinner. His mom was a good cook. 
I remember his dad coming home from work, washing up, and changing his shirt as he prepared for Shabbat. Mori Haas was a quiet man with deep conviction. It was clear to me where Jeff's quiet strength originated. In Jeff's home, the prayers were more elaborate than in mine. They all sang with such enthusiasm. When I was married with a family of my own, I had Jeff record the chanting of Kiddush on my pocket dictaphone. And I went home and played it over and over and over until I could do it without uh, playing the tape. And I've done so ever since. I don't remember Jeff having a lot of girlfriends, but when he met Vicki, it was clear the stars were in alignment. He was so proud to be with her. He often told me, you can't imagine how brilliant she is. And we all know that to be true about Vicki. They shared a passion for intellectual curiosity and integrity, for Judaism, Israel, caring for the less fortunate, and most of all, caring for each other and family. Their marriage was based on love and mutual respect. When Matthew came along, Jeff was in ecstasy. No one could have loved the child more. He was proud of every developmental milestone and loved to share. Matthew did this. Matthew did that. Matthew's prowess in chess and his academic brilliance were at the top of the list. When Avi came along, it was the same. He loved Avi's sense of humor. He often talked about Avi's sense of humor and the way he handled life's challenges with ease. We see Jeff's fine qualities living on in his children, brilliance, great strength of character, and always with a gentle quality. The friendship between Jeff and I blossomed into a friendship between our families. Jeff's parents, Maury and Ethel, Vicki's parents, Sharon and Shelley, and my parents, Howie and Jerry, would sit at the kiddush table on Shabbat afternoon talking for hours. Vicki and my wife, Randy, connect on so many levels and have been wonderful friends for decades. Finally, our kids, all graduates of Solomon Schechter Day School, now grown men, have developed a very special friendship over the years. When our families would get together for dinner, we all knew there would be serious, stimulating conversation and side-splitting laughter from beginning to end. We always look forward to being together. Jeff and I once took our boys on an exciting road trip all the way to Michigan City. We had a great time. One memory that will stick with us, I'm sure, was driving around, getting lost while looking for the Indiana Dunes, and somehow ending up in the middle of a wedding party. We laughed about it for hours. Jeff was the kind of friend you could immediately reconnect with, even after long periods of separation. Never any awkwardness. There was never a hidden agenda or need to carefully measure your words. For me, it was as if we were right back in the car driving around town at 3 AM. I'm so glad Jeff got to see both his sons married to such fine women. He was fortunate to become a grandfather and to observe Matthew as a father to his beautiful uh, uh, to, to Matthew's beautiful daughter, Maya, and see Avi well on the path to becoming a doctor. Throughout his life, Jeff demonstrated the finest qualities, honesty, integrity, unconditional love for friends and family. He was a quiet guy who talked, law, uh, talked less and did more. He was proud of all of us and had our backs. He led a Jewish life and was proud to support Israel. Jeff was the definition of a righteous man. He will live on in our minds and our hearts forever. Please rise for the memorial prayer. Elamalei Rahamim Shochein Bameromim Hamtsei Minucha Nechona Tahat 
kanfehi hashchi hina bemahalot kedoshi mutorim kezorarakia maziri lenishmat Yitzchak Isaac ben Moshe ve etalea shehalach leolamo began Eden tehei menuchato ahanabal harachamim Hastirehu beseter knafecha le olami. Utsiror bitsorachayim et nishmato. Hadonaihu nachalato. Vianuach. Beshalom al mishkavo venomar amen. O God, exalted and full of compassion, grant perfect peace in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure to the soul of Jeffrey Elliot Haas. Yitzchak Isaac ben Moshe Etolea, who has gone to his eternal home. Master of mercy, we beseech you, remember all the worthy and righteous deeds that he performed in the land of the living. May his soul be bound up in the bond of life. The Lord is his portion. May he rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the presence uh, with us this, this afternoon of fellow members of the clergy, Rabbi Nate Crane and Cantor Pavel Reutman from the HBE, Rabbi David Flinkenstein from Chabad and Romet, Rabbi Shlomo Tannenbaum from the Ark, Rabbi Mordechai Gershon from Chabad in the South Loop, Rabbi Carl Walk Volken, Emeritus Beth Shalom in Northbrook. And if I have left anyone out, uh, please forgive me, but your presence here is a strong tribute to Jeff and to the whole family and brings them all some strength and comfort. Ladies and gentlemen, the interment service will continue at Memorial Park Cemetery located at 9900 Gross Point Road here in Skokie. The family will be returning to the Haas residence at 720 Lamont Avenue in Wilmette. Please note that the Shiva starts at 730 this evening. All the Shiva information is on the service folder. When you walk in the house, please note the Shiva etiquette. Please take a minute to read it. Vicki and her sons have requested that any guests that have traveled from out of town who are here at the funeral are invited to the house immediately following the interment service. Memorial contributions in his memory to the Ark would be appreciated. All that information is on the service folder. And for the many people that are online watching, ladies and gentlemen, you could go to our website and find out the Shiva information and the specifics uh, about the Ark. For those of you who will be driving in the funeral procession to the cemetery, the procession will be forming in our parking lot. Please obtain an orange safety funeral sticker to place on the right-hand side of your windshield. Have your bright lights and hazard lights on at all times. For additional measures of safety, please use your uh, signals, use your horn. Uh, please do not speak on your cellular phone while driving to the cemetery. Also, please do not approach the family until the burial is done. We'll have the shura, and it's at that time you may offer words of consolation. This time I ask the pallbearers to please come forward and everyone to please rise as we escort the casket of Jeffrey Elliott Haas from the chapel then you may return to your cars. <laughs> 